Kia ora all and welcome to the Strategy and Planning Committee meeting for the 10th of November. Um, nice to have you here, Edward. We've got um, apologies, unfortunately, from Dr Lynn Carter and Michael Deeker, Councillor Deeker. I'll move that those be accepted. Thank you, Carmen, uh, Councillor Hope. Yes, I'm happy to support that. I'm just thinking that if Councillor Deeker has a leave of absence, um, do we need to... I, I have just sorted some advice on that, and I thought it was better to do it in the meantime um, and, and get that sorted for the next time we've, we've, we're seeking that advice. Because it was done earlier, I thought I should be more consistent. Madam Chair, the, the standing orders talks about uh, when, when a leave, leave of absence, absence is in play, that it should be recorded as a leave. As an apology yeah, in the okay. minutes. That's what it says. But okay, th thank you for having me. automatic then. Yep. Thank I moved seconded, Councillor Hope. Thank you. Uh, all in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. Uh, there's no request to address the committee under the public forum. Confirmation of the agenda. I'm going to ask that we rearrange the agenda to allow staff. Oh, Anita, you're amazing. Um, she's raced over here from mediation. We'd like her to get through and have some lunch break today. So if we could do items, uh, confirm the agenda with 7.3 and 7.4 going before 7.1, 7.2 and 7.5. That's okay. Um, I'll move that. Seconded, Councillor Robertson. Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. Conflict of interest, just noting that please stand aside if there's any um, matters here that you have a conflict with, but I know that you all understand those rules. Uh, confirmation of the minutes. Um, we've had circulated the minutes of the 13th of September Strategy and Planning Committee. Any, uh, I'm happy to move. Seconded, Councillor Hope. Any discussion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Outstanding actions from resolutions. It's item six, page seven of the agenda. Are there any comments to be made on those two matters there that we have both are pro are progressing, basically? No comments? So we'll move on. Matters for consideration, 7.3, housing bottom lines. Welcome, Carl and Anita and Gwyneth. You pass it to him, please. He can borrow mine. That's for the next one. Oh, the next yeah. Time. Okay. I'll just put all my notes on it. Oh. Just turn it off, or? Okay. Oh. Who, who would like to introduce the paper? Okay. Yeah. Uh, kia ora, uh, Madam Chair, Councillors. Um, this paper is about the uh, introduction, introduction sorry, of uh, housing bottom lines into um, currently blank appendices in the proposed, or partially operative, sorry, RPS. Um, that is a function of analysis that's been undertaken under the NPSUD to, um, through um, housing development capacity assessments for both Dunedin City and Queenstown uh, urban areas, which are tier two urban areas under the NPSUD. Um, those assessments uh, produce all sorts of uh, useful information, uh, covering a whole range of um, issues relating to housing uh, in particular in uh, Dunedin and Queenstown. Um, and one of the uh, follow-on actions from that is for us um, as the responsible regional authority to insert housing bottom lines um, into our RPS um, in order that the TAs can then insert those same figures into their district plans and then undertake uh, any required plan changes to their planning system uh, to enable those uh, minimum uh, housing capacities to be realised. Um, the NPS requires the um, insertion of those figures to be undertaken um, more or less without uh, any public input. Um, but the key point to note is that any changes that are undertaken to enable those figures to be realised uh, will be subject to public input themselves. So the, the figures are essentially a bottom line. Um, 
a, a minimum that must be met. Um, how those uh, will be met um, is, is the area for debate, not what they are. Um, there is a technicality related to them um, in the way that the, the MPSUD and the RMA uh, phrase um, how it refers to regional policy statements. Um, so we'll only be amending our uh, partially operative RPS um, that currently has an appendix um, or schedule, um, uh, which is currently blank. Um, so we can do that. Um, in terms of the uh, proposed RPS, we'll be doing that uh, possibly through either evidence um, or amendments through the Section 42A report so that the uh, panel can make those recommendations should they choose. Thank you. Any questions before we go into motion? Councillor Scott? Yeah, a couple of questions. First one is, <clears throat> do we as a council actually um, check up on how successful the TAs are in actually making that additional and necessary housing capacity? Uh, short answer is that the MPSUD requires us to have joint responsibility for doing that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of our own planning functions, uh, we need to ensure that our RPS uh, enables those TAs to do that uh, and would need to undertake changes to our other um, plans and functions in order to do that as well. Uh, we'd also need to uh, ensure that any planning decisions that we make on resource consents um, also take into account their impacts on um, realising those as well. So through the Chair, um, are we in a position now to, or is this ground zero or this is ground zero, is it? Yeah. So uh, in terms of how uh, the TAs will undertake to meet those requirements um, is essentially the next step, which is highlighted in the report around the future development strategy, which is exploring how uh, best to meet those requirements over the next 30 years. Um, and it would only be the, the shorter to medium term uh, requirements, if any, uh, that would flow through into plan changes in the short term. Uh, the longer term uh, targets are more about setting up infrastructure, um, which is you know, quite expensive, um, takes a long time to plan, takes a long time to build, uh, and a long time to fund. So essentially development opportunities that we have available today are a function of decisions that were made some time ago. Um, and the same thinking, looking ahead to what do we need in terms of infrastructure to support this growth going forward. Yeah, and, and just following on, Emirati, um, <clears throat> because development could be new greenhouse land and houses, or it could be uh, reinvigorating or adding net gain on our additional housing stock. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how all that follows through. It's interesting to see Dunedin, where over the next 10 years you're saying, yeah. you know, 5,820 in the 10 years. And then the following 20 years, a 5,510. Now, I'm an example of a person who's lived in Dunedin for a while, and forever there's been some pessimism over development sort of forecasts. And whereas in this, it's, it's relatively bullish for the first period, and then it sort of tails off. Why is that? Yeah, so um, as you pointed out, Dunedin, um, I guess in the last 30 to 40 years has, yeah. has been relatively static to, yeah. to almost declining yeah. um, and has in maybe the last 10 years um, experienced a bit of a population boom. Yeah. Um, what these projections are showing is both um, a small shortfall as a hangover from, from the past boom, but also that the projections show that that essentially boom is not expected to last in the longer term. Um, whereas Queenstown uh, has long been fast growing and is and is expected to continue to do so uh, despite um, a forecast um, impact from COVID. Cool, oh, thank you. Councillor Colbert. I'd like to move the, as, as per the order paper? As per the order paper. Okay, could, could I, um, that's uh, fine. And I, I was just gonna ask one question. Yep, but I'm, do, I'm just mindful yep. that you, uh, th thank you. Want to use Anita's time? Oh, no, my, most useful. So, thank you. <coughs> um, my only question was the areas. Um, so, when you say Queensland and Dunedin, that's yes. not all of Queensland Lakes or all of Dunedin. I presume it's only the urban area or 
around the fringe of zero? That's right. So the um, the definition in the MPSUD is a single word, Dunedin and Queenstown urban areas, and it's up to uh, the TAs uh, it does, alongside yeah. us to determine what that is. Um, so for Queenstown, it basically covers Queenstown or Greater Queenstown um, and Wanaka. Um, what does? They've determined to, to be um, part of their tier two urban area. So their uh, spatial plan essentially covers the Wakatipu Basin uh, and I think they call it the Upper Clutha area around Monica as well. Right. Whereas uh, Dunedin is focused on uh, the urban area plus Mosque. Thank you. We have no other questions. Oh, sorry, we have Councillor Hope. Sorry. Microphone, please. Mine's a little bit more nitpicky. I'm sorry, Kyle. Um, I would like to look at number 13, your paragraph, where you get your figure. Um, we underline the minimum amount, i.e. the bottom line, and we have a 15 to 20% buffer where we talk about reasonably expected house demand. And you've just been explaining about Queenstown. Hopefully we'll just, you know, keep going. Is that quite a reasonable 15 to 20% buffer? Wouldn't it be higher or is that just you – know, I'm just curious. For, yeah, so for that area. the buffer, uh, 15 to 20% um, is <coughs> in relation to uh, the time frame. So the short term, medium term and long term is basically what is the projected demand plus uh, 20% uh, in the short to medium term and uh, plus 15% in the longer term. Essentially that is added to reasonably expected demand to ensure that there's a, an amount of development capacity that's available over and above what's expected to essentially provide for um, flexibility um, and, and over provision, essentially. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, no other questions. Oh, um, did you want to speak to your motion? No one else wants to debate? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. Great report. Yes. Thank you. Next report is the RPS summary of decisions required. Of oh, requested, sorry. <coughs> not required. It's not us. We're not Freshwater Commission. Um, who's speaking to this one? Same team? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Go for We've it. Got a, a, a few slides. <coughs> yeah. I was put together for you. Are these on diligent? No, they're just No, that's fine. It's just not wasting the time of them looking for yeah. them. No, I didn't bring the solders down. I, I added a photo and said I wasn't going to carry them all down. Um, so this paper is essentially to highlight that uh, our submissions have closed. Uh, since the paper uh, was written, um, we've had the chance to analyse uh, some of the data that we have developed. Um, and uh, the solder itself, uh, or summary of decisions requested, has uh, ended up being over three volumes. It's about 1,500 A3 pages double-sided uh, with nearly 10,000 submission points in total. Um, about 6,000 of those ended up being from submitters <coughs> with, um, and sorry, I should have changed that, uh, addresses for service. So we did receive a significant number of submissions uh, via Greenpeace and a few um, other parties as well that didn't provide um, details enabling us and further submitters to contact them. Um, so we've basically separated those out into one of the volumes to enable uh, those submissions that do have addresses for service to um, ease their way through what is um, a fairly significant uh, bundle of paper, as you can see there. Yeah, the reason we've separated them out is to get a valid submission. You have to... The, re the reason we separated them out is um, it's not our decision to decide whether they're valid or not, but the panel has to decide, and if you can't um, serve someone um, and there's no way to contact people, then there is a, a potential that they'll be declared invalid. So mm. just put them to one side. Um, so a couple of slides that I just wanted to talk through here. Um, this is a, basically a daily count of submissions that we received um, leading up to um, – can you see my mouse here? <coughs> this is a closing date. This generally follows the pattern that we'd expect, a kind of a, a hockey stick leading up to the close of submissions. And you can see a massive peak there uh, where we received, started to receive the Greenpeace uh, ones and a bit of a flood um, about three weeks before we were anticipating anything at all. So uh, by the time we got in touch with them, um, that it had kind of petered out. Um, but they also changed their form, so submissions received after that point uh, did 
include addresses for service. Um, I've also highlighted there those that are, are considered to be late. Um, we have to advise the hearings panel of those and that the late um, is basically our deadline that we provided to um, submitters, um, of which there were a significant number received after that point, um, including some pretty major submitters as well. So that will be uh, <coughs> probably an argument that they will have to uh, make to the hearings panel uh, in due course. Um, this is uh, basically the same graph again, just uh, shown slightly differently and highlighting the volume of submissions that we receive from uh, Greenpeace without address for service in the light green, uh, with address for service uh, in the dark green, and then everybody else in the yellow on top. Uh, about 170 odd um, uh, other submissions, uh, about 190 Greenpeace submissions with addresses for service, and about 1,100 uh, without. So. You know, pretty good engagement, really. Um, uh, this is the stuff I think you're probably more interested in, uh, in terms of the submission count by uh, <coughs> chapter. Uh, and this is just counting those that we receive with an address for service. Um, so submissions that are essentially uh, deemed to be valid. Um, and there's two categories there for the land and fresh water chapter. Um, those that we receive from Greenpeace um, and those without. If you add those two together, the land and fresh water chapter potentially, unsurprisingly, um, received the most attention, though um, every chapter of the RPS did receive uh, some submissions. The uh, what we've called EMON there um, is a small chapter with a, about two paragraphs in it, but um, you know, somebody had something to say about everything, basically. What does EMON stand for? Uh, environmental monitoring. So we've got air. Uh, the appendices, coastal environment, um, ecosystems. ecosystems, thank you, uh, EIT, energy, infrastructure and transport, environmental monitoring, uh, GEN for general submissions, so those are submissions basically saying we like the IPS or we don't like it in a fairly generic way, um, hazards, um, heritage. heritage and cultural values, integrated management, the introduction, uh, surprising amount of submissions on that part of it. Uh, land and fresh water that we just discussed, natural features and landscapes, uh, resource management of resource management, resource management issues, uh, the significant resource management issues to iwi and uh, urban form and development. So just splitting those out by those that support. So those are people that said we like it, don't change it at all. Uh, <coughs> People that opposed it said, I don't like it at all, you should delete it. And everybody else we put into the amend uh, category, unless it wasn't really clear what people wanted, um, of which there was a, a fair number as well. Um, that's just the same graph, but broken down by percentage, just to give an idea about whether people uh, on a proportional basis liked, disliked, or uh, wanted some changes. Um, nothing much to see there. Um, the, the most popular uh, provisions um, in terms of those that we received the most submissions on, uh, potentially unsurprisingly, the land and fresh water um, visions are uh, pretty up there. Um, one of the key policies implementing that um, objective also received quite a lot of uh, submissions. Um, and uh, sort of working down the list there as well. Um, so, you know, some pretty extensive uh, thoughtful comment on on a whole lot of aspects of the plan um, and as we're working through now um, we're expecting to receive further submissions on Friday um, after which we'll summarize those and um, pass them on to the panel and will ORC be submitting further submissions do you, do you have to finish by Friday as well do you if you had to do that yeah yeah, yeah. If we were going to lodge a further submission, we would, but we've, there's been no request to do so, so yeah. we're yeah. not planning on it. Yeah. Questions? Councillor Scott? Yeah, you've got a mean opposing the support, so, and they add up to 100, but can't you ask to amend something but still say you support it? Yeah, the, so the, the approach that we took was um, uh, classically there's a support in part opposing part type approach. We took the approach that it was easier to say if people said retain it, don't change it, that was a support. If people said delete it, that was an oppose. And everybody else that wanted to change, whether they supported it in part or opposed it in part, mm. they wanted it to be amended. 
Yeah. Councillor Calvert. How we are on the going or is it just that we want this is purely information about the the, the process and the submissions. Yeah. Do you want to ask a question of staff about that? Am I confused about that? Can you ask the question? I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure your question. Um. Separately, the joint ORC and Forest and Bird High Court. Sorry, microphone, please. Sorry, separately, the joint ORC and Forest and Bird High Court application, which looks to me like ORC plaintiff, Royal Forest and Bird defendant. Have I missed something? Um, so we are the plaintiff, but we lodged those proceedings jointly. But we both lodged together as a joint application. Okay, and today's not the day we want to talk about any of that stuff. That's for another day. I, all right. The, the, my, my, uh, it is in the report, but I, it's not really important. I mean, it, yeah. it's an important. It's not important for today's question. There's I don't not, think there's so. not much we can discuss except yes. for that there's been a hearing set down for early February. Um, the parties who have uh, wished to join have done so, um, and there's some discussion around exchange timetables and. And things like that. So, um, you know, happy. That's the information. It's all on the website. Um, right. All of the um, parties uh, who have joined are up or yeah. about to be up. Yeah. So we'll um, be updating our website pretty soon with all of the papers toing and froing at the moment. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Is oh, that on the o uh, ORC website or is it yeah, on, yeah. on the RPS not page? Not till next week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm happy to move the uh, order paper, the, the note of this second. report. Seconded, yeah. Carmen, uh, Councillor Hope. Any other discussion, debate? I'm certainly not talking to it. Thank you for your. Great, great report, I Yeah. Good. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Don't Chair. get indigestion. Yeah. Slow down eating your lunch and enjoy. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for accommodating there. No, 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 absolutely. Thanks, uh, totally Anita. Thank you, Anita. Um, and enjoy your afternoon. Anita. Uh, next item is 7.1 oh. Otago Lakes. Who else is coming? So we. Strategic. Sorry, Otago Lakes Strategic Plan <laughs> Scope. This is to. This came out of the long-term plan discussion. If I remember right, then we want a bit of work done, and you guys come back with a suggestion as to how that work might progress. Does that help, more or less? Excellent. Would you like to speak to the report at all? It's, I think it's clear. Good. Um, I, I think we can probably take it as read, um, but I don't know. Yeah, if there's any point you want to clarify or so questions please councillor laws i would expect you to have one no not a question oh okay oh no if this was that wasn't facetious it was your recommendation i think well, that, that well I, okay well I, I, that's not us as a question then i remember that conversation pretty well and i promoted this policy um and in specifically it's aimed at the great lakes uh, of otago um, but my recollection of that conversation at the long-term plan is that it was designed, and so that's why I don't know it's picked up here, that it was aimed at assisting the amenity and environmental values of our lakes and working and collaborating with others. Now, one of the key others was the University of Otago and Dr. Mark Schellenberg and the work that those freshwater specialists are doing there. But they're not mentioned in this report. Did you consult or talk yeah, to them at all? That. So just to clarify, we go by what's in the resolution. So we've we've acted based on what's in that resolution, which is um, paragraph six, um, but so we'll be able to talk to uh, whether or not she's spoken to Mark Schellenberg. Yes, yeah, so we've spoken to Mark Schellenberg this morning. 
Um, that's why it's not in the paper. Obviously, the paper was written beforehand. Um, and we are aware that a lot of work is being done in terms of research and investigation, being done or being planned for the Great Lakes. And yes, there would be value in coordination. Um, so yes, we, we spoke with Mark, um, but we mostly focused on those people who actually are, or those organizations which are actively involved in managing lakes. So the like of Toitu Fenua, Toitu Te Fenua, um, uh, the TAs, etc. when we did the consultation. Um, there's one group also here that's not mentioned, it's the Guardians of Lake Dunstan. You don't appear to have consulted them? No, we haven't. We haven't. Um, we are aware that there are community groups, including the Guardians of Lake Dunstan, who would be interested parties, but for this very early scoping brief, we've really focused on those statutory uh, bodies. Um, but we would expect that as part of the consultant work at stage one and stage two, there would be a much broader um, engagement with those community groups as well as the University of Otago research institutes and um, and communities and of course the statutory bodies as well. Can I ask the question then why we need, if the motion of governance was to proceed down this line, why we now need a scoping study to see if it's a good idea? So we're just, the, most, the, the motion was to do to put some money aside to do a scoping mm -hmm. study. It's a pretty great? broad yeah. motion. And so I thought it advisable we come back to you so we're clear on expectations about what we're delivering um, as part of that scoping study. Um, so I don't want to go and spend $100,000 no, 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 no. before so, we get the wrong thing. So wouldn't the idea then be to come back to us and say, what did you have in mind for a scoping study? Because at the moment we're going to be paying a consultant to do that, aren't we? Is it, as I understand the motion here, is that we're going to pay an external consultant to the council a sum of money? Absolutely, because um, you, as this was done, as you said about, um, as part of the little 2 p deliberations, staff didn't have input into the resolution, and so I have no budget or people to do this resolution other than the hundred thousand. So I'm proposing to use that hundred thousand to actually form the scoping study. Hopefully not all of it. And, and, yeah, and is it well, if we don't use yeah. all of it, that's yeah. great. We can yeah. reallocate. I think that what the um, paper tries to highlight is that lakes management is actually quite a complex matter when you look at the number of, peop of people or organisations which are involved, but also our planning framework within ORC where we have the land and water plan, we have integrated catchment planning, which is going to start very soon. And then we um, are looking at an Otago Lake strategic plan. We need to see how they will fit together uh, so I think stage one is really to see whether the Otago Lake strategic plan will have value or whether it's going to be incorporated in the integrated catchment plans and the land and water plan. And so how that will work. So what are the gaps in lake management which aren't being dealt with and where the Otago Lake strategic plan can add value? And that's really, I think, the idea. I th I, uh, if I'm correct, I, I think some of this came out of the fact that also at the long term plan, we talked about prioritising river catchment work and we're expecting a report back on that, but we weren't clear where that was with the lakes, and that's why you, part of why you brought this up. Again, this is this is hastening my my unease. Um, that's what I perceive this paper to be as well, which is, is this a good idea, really? Um, who were you thinking of engaging as a consultant? On out to tender. That would be a matter of tender. A matter of going out for tender. So for proposals. Yeah. So. Okay, so you'll go to the market to tender for a consultant. Again, why wouldn't you go to people who are already out there working in this area? And because I'm thinking specifically of Mark Schellenberg and the University of Otago. So, um, just so can we, the resolution here puts aside budget to do a scoping study for a Otago Lakes strategic plan. Yep. The budget is 100,000. I need to use that because I don't have any staff. No staff was allocated towards this in the upper part of the LTP. I need to use that 100,000 to fulfil this resolution. And it's over two years, yep, over two years, 100,000 for two years. So in order to do that, I'm going to engage a consultant to do that work as opposed to using staff to do that work. And when do you expect them to report back by? In terms of phase stage one and stage two, yeah, uh, estimates and times. We're, again, we haven't gone through the process. We're coming back trying to make sure we've got our brief right, um, but um, 
we could probably have something out in terms of a request for a proposal before the end of the year um, to do the first phase of work. Yeah, stage, months. One, stage one is probably not very long contracts, yeah. probably in three months you can probably deliver the contract. So I would expect by the time we do the procurement process, have the contract, etc., at least by the end of this financial year, stage one would be completed and then it would take, I don't know, maybe six additional months to do stage two. So it would be well within the two years, yeah. which were in the... Um, so this year, at the end of this financial year, you would have... So there's $100,000 sitting on the kitty for, for this study now, for this year one. And you'll be using that scoping plan, and as you say, it shouldn't be very expensive and it shouldn't take very long either, really. It's essentially a consultation process, isn't it? Have I got that right? Yeah, maybe, uh, yes, essentially, a, a needs assessment. So maybe it would go also into doing a bit of a review of the existing plans that may be um, um, being managed by LEANS and other, and other parties and a review of um, knowledge gaps. Uh, but I think essentially it would be mostly consultation. So, but if you're looking for feedback from us today, which you are, that's why it's here. Um, my understanding of this was that it was separate from the land and water plan, which is why it's there. I mean, it was this was elevating it beyond those and giving it a specific budget. I, I'm not sure about the word elevate, but it does need to complement the land and water plan, absolutely, and that's part of the work that needs to be done to understand how it can complement the land and water plan. Um, yeah, but just so that you know, again, feeding back, it wasn't intended to necessarily complement. It was intended to be... An elevation is a really good word. It was intended to make that a specific area of interest and a specific idea of preserving our wonderful jewels in the crown, we call them, and then enhancing their value from both an ecological and an amenity point of view. Is That's understood, I assume? Um, I'm, I don't see the word in about enhancing or elevating lakes above anything in terms of the resolution. I'm just going by what was described in the resolution. So I absolutely understand in terms of the value of lakes um, to Otago. Um, I just want to clarify, we are talking about all lakes here. Um, that's I, yeah, yep. And that's a discussion. Can we just leave that yep. point? Because I think there will be questions about that um, when we get to the next level. I've got a question here from Councillor Forbes and then Councillor Robinson. Um, thank you for this. That's, uh, that's what I was expecting. Because I'm pleased to see that and see, see that we're doing some work here. Um, I am a little bit worried about, as Michael was, about other organisations with active role, and I realise you've taken the statutory. Oh, microphone, please. Oh, I realise you've taken the statutory organisations, but um, I'm wondering. I also worry about the um, the university. They have now appointed a chair of um, freshwater sciences and I think that probably indicates a fairly strong interest even if it's not a statutory one. I'd like to see that we were working, we've already had one meeting so far with the university, they're very keen to work more with us and I know that many councillors are keen on this too so I, I don't know how you're planning to do that but I think it's important that whoever goes out scoping at least talks to that chair of freshwater at the university, and I also think we need to acknowledge uh, th that there is a great variety of community groups that have a really big interest here. And while they may not be statutory, I think that they must be included in the scoping exercise. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's the intent. That for, that the for, intent? The, for the purpose of this paper, I focus on the statutory bodies, but as soon as we enter stage one, I, I expect that the consultation will be much broader. I did yeah. see the word include, mm. but I yes. just want to make, you know, we've only mm. just had this notification from the university that appointed someone. I'd like to see us as a council work more with the university too. Thank you. Who did Alexa. they appoint, uh, Alexa? Who's the chair? What's that? Who's the chair? Uh, they haven't named yet, but oh. they've, they've got the money for it. Uh, Dane, but, Carolyn, what's her name has given them the money for it. Sorry, I should know the last name. Barons. Thank you, Ann. I was just going to say, for your information, with our meeting with Mark this morning, um, there is a whole kind of research agenda around lakes that you're aware Intense, of, yes. and um, and that's certainly, but that has a research focus, which is not necessarily 
implicit in this proposal and um, th that's one of the questions is how do you actually integrate that into this uh, and at this by the same token we're token we're also talking to why Wanaka about the very same issue very same stuff thank you excellent thank you C councillor robertson no mine was resolved thanks thank you councillor calvert two questions um one of them i guess is for the future but partly where it says both stages will be carried out in partnership and in consultation with key, key stakeholders, it would be useful for me if when, instead of saying that, you said who you meant by key stakeholders, because quite often we imagine maybe different stakeholders than you do, or you reassure us that that's who you meant, but we don't know whether that's... Mm -hmm. and, and afterwards, you come back to us with things that say, we consulted with key stakeholders. I'd much prefer... We consulted with, and here's a list, or I, something, I, or we're going to. I think to the sales. issue there is that we're reflecting on our <coughs> agreed motion at council. Yes. Yep. Yes. So we need to do that. Yes. Um, oh, perhaps. <laughs> if, yes, but when it comes back to oh. us, if, if we have carried out what you said and we have consulted with key stakeholders. I see what you mean, sorry. Instead of using the word key stakeholders, if we could have the, with these actually, people. Actually, Lewis, I, think, um, I, I see what you mean, sorry. And misunderstood you. I completely... Um, see the risk, especially resource-wise, of overlapping documents and this, and how does it fit in with the other things and the like. But I still don't sort of understand why stage one is there at all, because mm. it says it's confirming the case for something that we're doing. But as I mean, we have asked for a scoping study, and it says part of the scoping study is to confirm the case for a scoping study. Well, I, so, so I don't. Yep, so um, as Sylvie's alluded to, um, she, we've had a number of um, conversations with people involved in um, management of the lake, um, etc. and we've had variable feedback as to whether a Otago Lake strategic plan is necessary. And so um, we want to spend more time understanding that um, that's what is required. There, I think there's probably consensus that something is required. It's just whether a strategic plan is a thing that's required. And so that's why we separate it to um, rather than going launching into doing a scoping um, study for a strategic plan that we don't get buy-in from various stakeholder, key stakeholders. Would you then imagine that after stage one you would come back and say we have found no case for doing what you've told told us to do or? so we might come back to you and say we don't have you know the relevant stakeholders that we've consulted are not in agreement for it but they do agree that we should do why instead or something like that yep so i'm just thinking that microphone sorry so there's the problem here the words <laughs> in a, so sorry we've, sorry we've got yes. a list sorry so i would have thought that still potentially one plan, clarifying the purpose, scope and function of the plan, of the development of an Otago Lake strategic plan. When you tried to develop that scope, it would become clear part of the way through that if it, there seemed to be a reason why we shouldn't develop it, namely people don't care for it or something, in which case I would have expected you would come back to us and say, you made a resolution telling us to do something. We've started doing it, but it isn't, we, we, we've struck a problem that you didn't anticipate because we... Yeah, and uh, kind of have now. We've kind of, we've kind of had our very early, and they are very initial discussions, right, yeah. because I don't want to spend 100000 doing something. And we've struck this thing that we're getting variable feedback. So our suggestion is now to split it slightly, and this is why we've come back to you so you can have a discussion about are we doing the right thing and meeting expectations, split it slightly so that we can actually do that piece of work more thoroughly. Um, and which is the stage one, just, um, and I think further down, what's the paragraph is it describes what stage one is? Um, um, 18. Yes. Yep. I think it's, I think the problem yep. with it is sort of confirming the case for doing something you've, you've been asked to do, sort of, rather than um, whether it, uh, yeah. it, it maybe the it's the words that are perhaps getting in my way when what you really want to do is say when you get started, it is, you've got some reason to believe that it's 
maybe shouldn't be done in the way that we've asked it to be done most usefully to us. Or, or that something. stakeholders, relevant yeah. stakeholders, don't believe that that should be done in the way yeah. that's been usually asked. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so uh, confirming the business that sort of the case for it just sort of gives the impression that we've asked you to do something and you're not sure that it's a good plan and so you want to start by confirming whether our plan is a good plan, which is sort of feels a bit awkward to me. Okay, we well, think about that because you maybe want to be nuance the motion that we put because obviously there's some concern there. Mr Allison. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and through you, um, thanks for the paper. I had to go back and forward over it to try and understand where it was going. Now I understand from the discussion and your explanation that you're looking for some clarity on it. I I was, was comforted when I saw stage one because that would allow Tangata Whenua interests to be properly understood and factored into whatever might be looked at going forward because some of the jewels in the crown in terms of lakes are not necessarily the ones at the top of the catchment. We know they're, they're jewels and they need less work. Some others need a lot more work. So I just raised that point. We would probably look at this world a wee bit different from it through a cultural lens. That's all I'm, I'm raising. So, so I, I, was a, I wasn't... I've been informed, I think, through the discussion and clarification. The, 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 the way I'm proposing, thank you for that, because I am concerned that what I thought was going to be part of this work was the upper um, lakes of Otago, and it now seems to have got much broader. Um, but I, that's what I think we need to test as the first part of the motion before we actually even go into the possibly just to test that out. But I'll do that in the second part of that's. Um, after the first round of questions, if that's okay. Um, Councillor Kelleher. Yes, thank you. Um, just following from this discussion, because when I read it, it really concerned me that um, obviously there are concerns amongst staff that this may or may not be needed. And we set aside, when we put the resolution, we set aside a budget of 100 and 100 for two years. Now, what I'm worried about is that we will spend a big chunk of what is needed for the budget um, to create the scoping study on actually the discussion with a consultant on whether we do it or not. And so I wonder whether, um, would a better way have been that internal amongst staff um, or more funding was looked for to actually do stage one as opposed to it eating into the total budget of stage one and two? So um, the answer to that is because it was, wasn't brought as part of the staff from LTP, I have a budget of 100000 I think it's probably in my remit as manager to decide whether I think I allocate a staff member to chew up that 100 and put it towards their salary or I put it out to a consultant as the best way to use that 100000 That's what we're talking about. I've, I've said we've allocated, fully allocated as staff, so I think the best course of action is to use the 100000 to get a consultant to deliver the scoping study. Because if I use staff time, I'm putting pressure on all the other work programs that we have to deliver under the LTP. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right. So See you. Quite, I'm, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I suppose we, what I'm starting to hear and is starting to concern me is um, that perhaps staff are challenging the need for the study or whatever the case may be. What I would say is... If you remember the origin of the resolution, it came up at the very last minute for the LTP. Um, when you were when you were doing uh, your deliberations on the LTP, and there were a number of things that were put we had a very we had very con constrained time. Yes, yes, and there was a last minute um, a last minute resolution, and this is it. Um, now. It hasn't gone through the normal process where staff would have evaluated a need um, and where a piece of work might fit in terms of <coughs> our overarching strategies and our regulatory framework and all of that. Um, it simply arrived as a resolution without any any further you know work before that. So as I understand it, what we're really asking is 
that we understand that we have a task, which is to, to uh, establish and fund a scoping study for an Otago Lake strategic plan. Through the initial consultation that we've had with parties, it is very unclear as to the appetite for or the thing that's required over and above the other plans and policies and strategies and other things that we are either working on or currently have. And so what is necessary is to effectively take a backward step and that's what stage one is about, which is confirming the case for the development of a strategic lakes plan. Because otherwise, if we don't, if we don't have a good look at it, we could develop the wrong thing, go down the wrong path, um, or think we're filling a need that others don't agree there is a need for. So that's really what it's about. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Scott. And then we've got Councillor Malcolm. And then Merritt Robinson. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's it's not... Question, before, please to use the mic. It's a, it's, it was on, but you weren't I, near I, it. I don't actually have a question. I was going to get into this debate. Sorry, thank, oh, thank you. Yes. Councillor Malcolm? Oh, well, I'm exactly the same as Mr Scott. Sorry. So am I. Oh, OK. Sorry. OK. Uh, now, I can do questions. I think there's two parts to this um, motion, though, that's come around the table. And bear with me as chair if you think I'm going around. Can... I, who, the, my gut feeling from this was that it was about Wanaka, Wakatapu, Dunstan, and Hawea. Have I, and sorry, I'm not trying to put a word in there. I am just trying to get clarity from people's memories of that discussion. Or was it, I mean, I was surprised to re read my, but I love it and visit more, more often than any of the others, Salt Lake in there, um, <laughs> which I wouldn't have thought was going to be part of the study. So, um, can can I just get an idea for hands up for those that remember that, that recall the rather we were under the pump time rise. Who thinks it was just about those bigger lakes, or who? No. If you thought it was, or have I got that wrong? I thought um, it was about all the lakes. All of the lakes, okay. Yeah. yeah. So who thinks it was about the all of the lakes? Hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. It was about yeah. all the lakes. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. So it was it was both. Both. Okay, that's yeah. great. So yeah. we were talking about making sure that the pristine value of the Great Lakes. Was preserved and, but it was also picking up those lakes that were severely degraded, yeah. and doing an assessment of them and whether or not remediation. Would be so this, this is the priority thing that we talked about. Was we're doing the priority work that I think Dr. Palmer's doing with, uh, about the rivers or the catchments, and you're this is about the lakes. Is that sort of where you were at? Well, the resolution. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what the resolution says because it doesn't matter what we remember. It's all about. And, and yeah, it's all about the resolution. Well, maybe this is our chance because we were That's absolutely right. under the pump to get the resolution correct mm. and and better informed. So um, I'm 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 happy to take a debate, but if people want to get working under a consensus model um, to get to the best resolution we can to tell the staff what we expected, I'm just wanting to that that really to be the constructive focus. Uh, look, I, I'm since you were chair, Mr. Malcolm. Councillor Malcolm, of that time, you and, might want to. That was when I was outside, <laughs> <laughs> Re redoing the numbers, <laughs> if you recall. Um, and I think that number got put in there to make someone else that had gone happy, and it's a very important. Um, look, I just, I, I will have a question at the end of it, but I, I, I commend you in the way staff and the way they're actually putting this together because I think that's the missing links. Because we've got Lynns, we've got the cities, mm -hmm. we've got the district councils, we've got. Uh, Guardians of Wanaka, we've got the uh, DOC, uh, we've got all these people actually looking after the lakes, and they actually all might have a very, very good strategic plan to look after the lakes. So until we actually assess them all and put them all together in one package and see what we've got there, uh, why would we be doing anything else? Because if they are simply, um, if they are effective and good, uh, it might be perhaps time we did our job as a regulator to say, well, actually, here's your st strategic plan. This is what you can sense, say. Hmm. Well, are you actually doing that correctly? So we might not need an overall Otago hmm. uh, strategic plan. We might actually just need to, to at the end of the day, to say, well done, great plan. Let's see that action happening. So I I think the way forward is, is uh, the correct way to do it. And is this why you put it into two stages? That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Robertson, <laughs> Councillor, I'm sorry. I'm tempted to rescind the, um, the yeah, whatever it is, 
the water so resolution. Mm. Um, the reason for, sorry, I probably would need a seconder if I was going with that, but I want to explain it. Um, the staff have written this report doing the best they can with the resolution we've put together that's very broad and um, undefined. Basically, it says similar to if we wrote down create a strategic plan within a management plan lying underneath that, looking at improving river or waterway health across Otago. It's kind of quite similar, or yeah. wetland health across Otago. Um, so we've done the absolute best that they can with our resolution to try and paint some sort of picture for us of how a project could come together with that very broad um, bounds. So really they can't come to us today and say, hey guys, you've got to narrow this down to something that's actually workable. Um, and they can't really come to us as well and say, hey, actually there's a whole lot of programs already happening. We've got um, regulatory with the land and water plan under development at the moment, going through really good public process, et cetera, to get to um, where communities want to go with this type of stuff. Then we've also got um, existing strategies. For example, we've got the... Um, Biosecurity, which is a plan. We've got biodiversity strategy underway. Uh, we've got, in terms of amenity, that brings in the navigational safety stuff as well. There's a lot there. Um, heap, you know, that's just a bit of it. Then there's a whole heap of community projects, ICM type projects going on just in lakes. Um, so staff can't come back to us and say, hey, guys, hey, there's a whole lot already going on there as well. Do we really need this at the moment? I'd be tempted, instead of spending a whole lot of money, actually to have a paper coming back. I'd rescind this resolution. I'd bring a paper back that gives us information further even on what we have got in place, if that's what people really want to do. We don't need to spend a whole lot of money with a consultant further narrowing this down to the scope, I don't think. I think we can do that ourselves to what we really want and what is really actually meaningful. And I think that underlying is what we're actually being asked to do. Or, or to do a workshop at some stage yeah. to do that. Okay, mm. that's, uh, hold that thought. We'll get yeah. to that point. Question. I've got Council of Laws first and then... Quick question. Uh, well, probably this question to staff. Is that I... I understood from what Director Elson was saying that the, the work to be done on this project needed additional either uh, additional work power, and her decision was to use the consultant yeah. for that work power rather yeah. than start yeah. hire a full time staff. So yeah. is that correct? So no matter what yep. we're about to do here, you need additional. No, no, I'm going to use. Um, I don't think. I think we will be able to do it with the two hundred thousand that's currently in the LTP. But what yes. I'm saying is, I'm going to use consultants to do it rather Correct. than staff yes. because yep. this Agreed. was addition, um, yeah. and I hadn't budgeted staff to do this work as part yep. of the LTP. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Laws. Uh, first of all, no dispute as to who gets to do it. Whatever you know, when it says it's a consultant, it's a consultant. Better than staff, it's not an issue. The question that comes out of this is, why do we need a plan? And the answer to that question is, why do we need a strategic plan? Because the history of the Otago Regional Council proves that we do. Because without a plan, we plan to fail. Yeah. And that is the reason why the threats currently exist to Wanaka, Dunstan, Wakatipu and Hawia from biological uh, agents that we did not pick up because we didn't have a plan to monitor them and they arrived and now we are dealing with the consequences. So we are looking for a strategic plan that affects not just our Great Lakes, our jewels in the crown, at enhancing the ecological and recreational amenities of those jewels but also those lakes in our region that are so severely degraded that we just don't care and we've wiped them off. A good example of that would be Lake Johnson. 
Um, but Waihola would be up there too. Anywhere where you are starting to get the kind of seasonal poisoning of these lakes, you know you've got a problem. Hayes is a good example. We got to that really late, but the damage has already been done. Now, what we're trying to do with the strategic plan is go, where are we? How can we get to a better place? And how can we pick up these degraded lakes and remediate and remedy them? How can we make all of these lakes in Otago better? Now, if they fall into some sort of land and water plan, I fear that we will not provide the energy and the intellectual brain power that we need to confront those tasks and to complete them. Now, three years ago, and I've, it didn't just come out of the long-term plan at Queenstown, can I say, because I've been sitting around this table for five years arguing this with about as much passion as I've got now. And I've sat and talked to Mark Schellenberg and the research team at University of Otago, and one of the first things they say is, you know what? You need a strategic plan because then we can get everybody on board and we can decide what we're going to do, where we are, and how we're going to make things better. So there's the answer to why we need a plan. Um, so let's answer that question. Stage one. Go and do the scoping study, that's fine. And I'm sorry, but Brian, you sat around this council table and we've watched those lakes degrade over the last 10 to 15 years, and I'm not prepared to sit around this table doing nothing again when we have an opportunity and some funding to go and find out what the problem is, create the solutions, proceed. And we've got some great people to help us. Councillor Scott. Yeah, I'm sort of going back to the question, actually, because it, it's actually, um, if, we, if we put the personalities out of it, um, it's actually an important debate. Um, <clears throat> Because we all want the same things. We, we all want um, our lakes. Uh, we want to preserve our magnificent great lakes. We want to restore those that need restoration, your haze and your way holder and the tomahawk and all that type of stuff. Um, but also our rivers, you know, and, and it's all so integrated. And so my question is, my question is, is... Because, you know, like, I also, you know, want the Great Lakes, you know, to be sorted. But my question is really, I'm holding a lot of stock on this land and water plan. Yes, we need a plan. A lot of this is words, you know. You know, Michael, with respect, you talk, the resolution says all lakes, not just the Great Lakes, you know. So why, what about the rivers? You know, like, so, like, are we diminishing, like, by having this conversation, are we diminishing, you know, the land and water plan? I, I'm holding a lot of stock on this plan. If we're not successful with it, then I don't know what our next move is in in, in terms of doing the right things for our rivers, our wetlands, our lakes, every damn thing, integrating it, you know, like some of the question is to the CE. The question is to the CE is... Sarah, what, what's in your mind, you know, would the land and water plan meet the needs of what Council of Laws is saying for the lakes, but also meet the other needs? And, and, and why is it going to meet the needs now in our previous planning documents have fallen short? Hmm. We could talk for a long time about all of that. Um, uh, but... Um, the land and water plan, of course, is for the most part uh, a regulatory plan, uh, although we can have non-regulatory methods uh, and talk about a non-regulatory approach. So um, in a pure sense, you could say, well, you know, yep, the land and water plan could be it. Um, one of the things that uh, we're working on at the moment is just as a bit of a planning framework to say, okay, well, you know, do we need a strategy as well as do we need a plan? Um, in some cases, we have strategies for particular things like biodiversity, for example. Uh, and and I guess what they do is is do some of that non-regulatory stuff and they, they give us some priorities uh, that are perhaps uh, slightly uh, more tailored towards that non-regulatory side. 
I think we have to understand where the gap is. Um, so, yes, the lakes aren't, uh, what, as we know, I mean, you know, different lakes have different issues and some lakes are doing pretty well. Other lakes have, have some challenges. Um, we are working on some of those, as you know, Lake Tuakatoto um, and also uh, Lake Hayes are in this year's worth of work for the, uh, for the LTP. Um, so we are proceeding on that and I think we'll make some headway. What I think is important, though, is the point that I, I feel the staff are trying to make, which is if we don't find the gap, potentially we can duplicate a whole lot of effort and what you end up with is more planning and no implementation. And so I think there has to be some balancing around that. Now, we can do the scoping study uh, and, and have a look at what uh, people think is needed. Uh, my sense of it is that's one option. The other option is that through the conversation that we're, we're actually just in the upper lakes like now, um, let's use that to help inform us a little more about some of the conversation and some of the issues. Now, it doesn't cover all of Otago, but it certainly covers some of the lakes that Councillor Laws was talking about. Um, and let, let that inform us a little more. So that gives us another stakeholder lens at the same time as we've been talking to some of these key people. Um, yeah, it's, I haven't uh, recently spoken to Mark Schellenberg, so I'm not going to say what he thinks or doesn't think. But I do think there is a sense of confusion about what us doing a lake strategy might achieve at this point in time. So it's worthwhile sort of teasing that out a bit um, before we do anything further. So is, is your recommendation to can you down this track or, or whether, as Councillor Robinson says, maybe to withdraw it and simply produce a, a paper on opportunity or, or strategy. We might know the gap um, already. I think if if you want my absolute best advice, it would be that through the land and water plan process, you are going to get some further understanding of the circumstances in every catchment in Otago, which will include mm -hmm. the lakes of Otago. That will position you to be in a much better place to put um, some strategic investment into something for lakes, if that's found to be necessary over and above what can be achieved through the land and water plan process. Thank you. Um, before we go to, uh, Councillor Malcolm indicated he wants to move it and then Councillor Hope to ask a question or speak. I do, I do want to but ask can I just ask one question, and I'm not, not sure if it's for you or for Dr. Palmer, the discussion that started, that this was also around, in my recollection and at, at the meeting, the long-term plan, was that we are already doing prioritisation work on freshwater rivers as part of, um, and priority projects. I think Dr. Palmer's doing that. But we didn't, that doesn't, I think, include the lakes, which is what the gap filling to a certain extent was, I think. I believe it's catchments, but um, yeah, pa it's not, it's Governor Palmer. It's not so that lakes. would include a it's lake. It doesn't. It does include Dr. Palmer. Yes, it's at a catchment scale, so it includes all water bodies okay. and relevant land features in that geographic unit. Okay, so that's happening already. Really? Okay. And we're looking to bring the report back, or at least a briefing to council, late this month or no later than next month, on that ICM framework. Thank you. Councillor Malcolm. I'd want to move the motion. As as in the standing order, yeah, it, as, in, in papers? As, as, in, as, as in the paper. Yep. Thank you. And do you have a seconder? I'll happily second it. Then Thank you. My question. Councillor Hope. Do you wish to um, speak to that or are you happy for uh, questions to continue? And, and, uh, I'd save it time for later as well, just in case there's something I've got to rebuttal or, <laughs> or, or even you're, support. You're... Hey, um, <laughs> We actually need to know where we are, are at now, but but I believe that this uh, is stage one gives us actually is giving priority to our lakes. It's something we sit around here and talk about water all the time, and it's always the rivers. And we actually don't. I've never seen a conversation here apart from when Councillor Laws talks about his precious lakes, and I mean that's no, no. uh, um, as uh, yeah, I mean that is a good thing. 
Um, and uh, so we never actually, and so the lakes seem to be a byproduct of all these discussions. So I think it's actually critical that we do give them priority, but the pr priority that we'll give them will come later after this report, and then we'll actually quantify at the end of stage one what what priority want, we want to give them, because we will then understand what their values are, their states, and their and their pressures as in uh, A, and under B, we'll understand their current frameworks and current ma management strategies all around them. So that's I think that's really lacking in our, uh, certainly in my head space at, at the moment. We'll also understand the roles and responsibilities of all the other parties that are involved. So I think that's absolutely critical that we get to that stage. And what we're really doing is actually trying to, but you, you can't write as, it's pointless trying to write a strategy or say, do we do we need a strategy until we actually understand what we've got at the moment and where the gaps are and where we and what we're trying to achieve. So I think this first part is superb. We've then got to break the end to sit and consider it. Um, we're going to spend some money to do it, uh, regardless of its staff time or consultants' time, and I'll leave that to the director. But I, um, I, I just think this gives um, – it just puts the lakes – I'm not saying it gives them high priority, but it puts them in a, a box on their own that we definitely have to look at and refer to. So I'm very comfortable with that process at this stage, and I would hope that you would support the intention of the motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hope had a question first, and then Councillor Forbes. Thank you. My question is really whether it's in your scoping study or in the upper lakes, which is your, where you are now doing your practical work, is this. We talk a lot about what's in the lakes and on the water, but one thing we haven't made mention, and I can't find it here, which is why I'd like some clarity, and I went with Councillor Forbes for a walk on Lake Dunstan, and we noticed all the, lo the, all the logs at the end of the lake, wasn't it, Alexa? Now, they seem to be a problem. And I don't know whether that comes under dangerous for the harbour master, you know, if you've got another boat that, that, that brings into it, collisions. We don't mention that here, and I do feel it's a factor that needs to be um, correlated somewhere in, with, with any of this research that we're doing, not only probably because they've been sitting there, but what, what are they doing to the lake, the dangerous collision that they're causing, and other things, and they were just everywhere, weren't they? Yeah, uh, and I think we had quite a lot of discussion with uh, different councillors from CODC on it, but I've just never seen anything moved. And I'm not sure about you, councillor. Laws living there, have you seen any action where those like those logs are moving? Yeah, the problem is that, and this is one of the reasons I think we need a plan. Hmm. Yeah. In this particular case, hmm. there are so many agencies who are responsible but not. Yep. In that particular case, Lynn's. Right. Contact Energy, Central Otago District Council, mm. all have various responsibilities around that and all have assumed it. And so the guardians of Lake Dunstan, a small pressure group, have in actual fact put pressure to, on Contact Energy to do something about clearing it up because they consider that most of this issue is theirs mm. from the way in which they manage the river and right. the flow of it. Right. But that gives you a really good example of these sort of microcosms where Interconnected we don't have a plan. Yep. This is just ad hoc. Mm. Uh, here's a problem. But yep. there's not a solution because nobody has a necessarily a legal responsibility. Yep. So therefore, nothing happens. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor My question is, I, I thoroughly... Um, think that we need a plan. I really do. We need to start looking after these lakes. We don't. And I'm wondering, would it be easier if we have a golden thread back to the um, FM um, FMUs. 20 and, and all, all the fresh water management, FMUs, all the legislative, over, uh, the over over um, arching legislative, legislative and iwi structures that we operate under? Would that be easier if we did it that way? But um, I don't. I feel like as Michael does about those lakes. But I actually feel that about all the lakes throughout Otago, and I think it needs to be all of Otago. We need to look at these. But it just worries me that it feels like we don't really have somewhere for this plan to sit, and it needs to sit somewhere. And I guess it is under land and water plan. But if it's not specifically on the lakes, how will it get lost? So I think um, I think that's why. Involving stakeholders and getting the buy-in is really important, right? Because 
it doesn't have a there won't be a, a legislative hook necessarily. There might be parts of the plan a plan, should we do a plan, that would be delivered through regulatory means, but there might be parts of a plan that aren't. Um, and therefore if you haven't got the relevant stakeholders on board and they don't agree then and, and they agree that there is needed one uh, there is a strategic plan needed and that they're prepared to deliver their part in a strategic plan then you probably won't have you won't actually deliver your strategic plan in the first place so i think the doing stage 1 where we're working with those different uh, key stakeholders and groups to establish the need a piece that will do that will be the beginning of the buy in process that will hopefully mean should a strategic plan eventuate it will have the buy in to deliver on that strategic plan so that's where we're getting somewhere then and we do need to have it within those regulatory frameworks somehow. So maybe the question is more, how do we get, and maybe that was the answer, a, pl a plan such of the, as this um, structured properly within the regulatory frameworks with the relevant stakeholders so that we can deliver a strategic plan for all of our lakes? That's what stage one is, isn't it? Oh, no, well, no. Is that what Alex is asking is. a much different question. Yeah, yeah. I am. Yeah. She's actually saying, really, if I can distill it, we need to play a leadership role. So it's about us in actual fact leading into that space and then bringing people on board. I'm concerned that it's the other way around in this paper, which is if there's a stakeholder that doesn't like it, I could tell you one now, and that would be contact energy, um, we might walk away from it. Whereas I think in actual fact it's better to say we want to do something, would you like to join us? We're at a really good place now with Linz. They've appointed someone specifically to look into this area and to assist. We've never had Linz in the space that we are in now. I'd still like an answer to the question about that overarching regulatory framework that we can yep. structure this. So, I mean, this comes to the core of the regional council functions, right? Mm -hmm. You have regulatory yes. functions yes. and you yes. can have non-regulatory functions yeah, if right. you they choose do to do, wish to do so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that they don't necessarily, yeah, there's not necessarily direction to do a lake strategic plan. Therefore, parts of that might be uh, delivered through regulatory functions, but there will be whole sections that potentially aren't. And you've got it, you've got to take that. Um, what you're talking about, I think, Alexa, looks more like the integrated catchment management framework that is being put in place where you would have the FMU process through the land and water plan, and then you would have an action plan for the FMU or the catchment of mm. the FMU to complement the different rules and policies and, and restore or get to where we want to be for our water bodies. And that's exactly the question that we're asking through this paper is, do we need a lake plan or do we need to integrate the actions for the lakes within our integrated catchment plans? And then, and that's where stage one will actually clarify what does lake management look like? What are the gaps? And that might be the lake margin management. We don't know yet, but someone needs to look at it and say, right, there are issues specific to lakes which would uh, justify the um, development of a, of a specific lake strategic plan. Or maybe there's just a matter of improving coordination through forums, meetings, etc., and then the plans would be the integrated catchment plans. So those are the decisions which need to be made. I don't think that anywhere in the paper are we arguing that we should be doing less on, no, no. or, you know, for, for lakes. It's more how do we actually structure our plannings for lakes so that we get to where we want to be. So if it is through integrated management, how do we make sure that there is within that a spotlight on the lakes? It's part of the scope of the report. I guess maybe it is, but I want to know that that's the case. Uh, Dr. Palmer, I think the ball was being figuratively thrown at you then. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is the right place. And I think when we come back to you with the suggested architecture of how all the plans kind of fit mm. together and that cascade from catchment down outcomes, all of that, I think will become much clearer as to where something like this would fit. Yeah. Okay, so I'm now going to, we've got a motion on the table and we've had a bit of discussion around it. I think we'll, so can you, you you want to say something to the motion now? Oh, absolutely, or you, if that's okay. Because yeah, you did say you want to do that and then I've yeah, got Councillor yeah, Robertson yeah, no, and anyone else after that. Okay, go for so, it. So is someone going to speak after me? 
I don't know. I think Councillor Robinson is. Yeah. Councillor Robinson is. So she could she go first then? Oh, I have okay, a right okay. reply. Then. Okay, then you do right reply. Thank yeah. you, Councillor Robinson and Scott. Yeah, I think, first of all, yeah, acknowledging that we are all wanting the same thing, which is to really look after our lakes. Obviously, we do have some world-class lakes in Otago, um, and everybody cherishes those lakes. Throughout the catchments, though, we have a whole range of other lakes, which have also been referred to, and I think everyone said that they care about them as well. Um, the shallow lakes across Otago are, well, actually across the world, really, are um, under huge threat. They're um, rare. Many of them have been drained. They're equally as important, as we know. So, yes, everyone agrees all the lakes are important. That's really good. So we're on the same page. I still feel, oh, OK, I'll probably support the motion. Everyone else probably will, but... Um, where I'm coming from is that I can really clearly see in my head, but then I'm kind of fortunate because I sit, I'm a co-chair of strategy and planning. I've been involved in developing water plans since a staff member in 2002. Um, I can really clearly see how this is already coming together through the new generation of planning, and if we don't get it right, then that's our own fault. I can see that we're at risk of duplicating um, what's already happening and spending money and time finding that we're duplicating that. So I'm going to say that because I feel that that is what we're doing. I think that we know that this process is happening anyway. I also feel that I care as much about wetlands and that we have legislative responsibility for them. I care as much about estuaries, which are kind of like a lake at the bottom of a catchment. I care as much about the coast. So I care as much about Otago Harbour. It needs a plan and is having one as well. I care then also about what's happening right around the coast. It's just as important. I find it really hard to break it down to lakes being the only issue in our catchments, which is why I then come back to exactly what Sylvie said, that um, the action plans for our catchments based on our priority issues, which will come out, is going to happen. That's all happening. And it's fair that all of our community has a say in um, what their priorities in their catchments are as well. But we have an absolute must given to us um, regulatory too that we must look after degraded and enhanced. So that's going to need to happen. Um, we must also look after wetlands. Actually, lakes are wetlands. They go in, they're actually defined as wetlands. So it all comes into one big pot of where the heck are we going with this? It's a very broad resolution. Uh, are we going to achieve anything more than what we're already achieving? Oh, I don't think we are. I think we're wasting time and money on something we just need to get on with. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Scott? I can't match that. I'm going to shut up. Uh, Mr Ellison? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would have to say I was uncomfortable with the paper, well, with the resolution when I read it. I hadn't seen it before. Uh, from a cultural perspective, we are mountains to the sea, interconnected, um, one and all. Um, the re various iterations of NPSs have finally got us to a point where I think we're making progress. And certainly, uh, the PC7, PC8, you know, some of them are still under appeal timeframes in that, but there is a real potential for Otago to turn its water management around. And I, I, to be honest, I'm reticent around this resolution, to be honest. Um, the, the partnership with Tangata Whenua, mana o te wai, if you understand it, is your tools. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Good up. Chia noon. Thank you. Just a couple of points. Um, I think that... You know, the lakes, just picking up on some of the conversation, the lakes have been sort of the poor cousin to a certain degree. And why I say that, I I met with Don Robertson 
who is uh, the chair of the Guardians of Lake Wanaka. And one of the things he highlighted to me was that from a, a water monitoring point of view, and if you take Lake Wanaka, for example, how much do we actually know about what's going on around the fringe of the lake? For Then we'll just use that one as an example. And that could well be something that falls out of this this process. Uh, and once we've had the stage one complete, et cetera, there may be some, some clear gaps around uh, environmental monitoring. There may be some clear gaps around um, RMA management in terms of what you can and can't do close to a lake, et cetera. So, I'm comfortable with the, the recommendation to take us to a better informed position to then decide to go to the next stage. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noon. Councillor Calvert, speaking to the motion. I was exhausted just by listening to the things that we should be doing. According to Councillor Robertson, and I agree with her about all of them, but it was just exhausting the breadth and depth of what we need to be doing. Yeah. Um, I th think especially in these times where we're not even sure um, what's going to come out of this RPS thing in February um, and we have a setup that involves freshwater commissioners looking at one area and possibly other bits of our work being separated out that it is worth having a lens on lakes. I, I, I think that they're only part of things and they should be integrated into everything else. But I think we're being encouraged by having the freshwater commissioner system to divide things out and not have an integrated approach because we're di we've got the freshwater stuff all out in a different area. So I think it is important to have some ability to look at the freshwater bodies of water. And then it may be that having looked at them, we think that that one goes there and that one goes there and that one belongs in there. But we just need to make sure we've got all of them under some sort of lens. And I don't think we're going to get them all under, under the same lens and making sure we're watching for the quality of the water in our lakes just by integrating them into everything else, especially since they have been separated off a little bit. So I do get the point that they belong with everything else, but I do think that they need to be looked at at least in an initial phase somehow as let's have a look at them all and if each of them has a right place to go after we look at them all and we've got them tagged so as we make sure they're being put in the right place where we can properly look after them that's the way to, for me thank you uh councillor Callagher. Yeah, look, I, I agree with the bulk of the discussion around the table um i'm a little bit worried about overthinking where we might get to uh, I will say that I'm a wee bit worried about stage one and stage two because I'm still got a niggle in my mind that stage one is more about talking us out of doing it rather than actually doing it. Um, I think there is plenty of sentiment around the table that um, we want it. Uh, we will be the regulator um, relying on stakeholders to then, because they may not want it, some of the individual ones, then, and that stymies what we are intending to do, worries me. So I'll be supporting it with some tentative concern around stage one. Good. Can I speak before you write a reply? I oh, certainly, uh, uh, thank Chair you. Wilson. <laughs> thank you. Uh, look, um, I'm, um, I've really enjoyed this debate. I think it's been really helpful, and thank you for uh, staff for bringing it to the table. I supported this in the May discussion. I'm now more concerned in some ways to see the ICM work um, before mm. we necessarily prioritise this, and I'd in some ways happily see it lay on the table, not to stymie it because I do want mm. to see it done, but just to see if that context, and I am also, thank you, Edward, for your contribution. Um, the complexity here is that um, the need for it I see as distinct, not to go across uh, to Mana Atawai, but because the number of parties involved in lakes is so much greater than those in 
uh, in the, the river main stem generally, not always. And especially now that we've got Linz as an active partner um, who want to contribute, which has been um, uh, something that we've all wanted along at the rivers. My real biggest concern, and the one reason why I'm actually just more reticent about whether we should lay this on the table, is actually that we are consulting on the FMUs at the moment. We are doing quite a lot of stuff out there and another consultation that requires quite a lot of input from the stakeholders, which is what this first bit does, just concerns me about the actual ability of those community groups to do this stuff, let alone getting um, Mana Whenua on the on page at the moment. It is that quantum of the work that causes me some concern because it it is a heavy load being borne by the community. They've done the plan changes, they've done the RPS, and that's an ongoing uh, process which they're all going to have to be involved in, had they got time and energy to also do a separate, distinct piece of work. Um, so I'm going to let the right of reply go. I'm not quite sure I could be happy either way. Um, I don't think you've talked to them. Have you talked to the motion yet? It's in Council of Laws and then... I just very, very quickly. Um, one group that we must not forget are the, who are a stakeholder are the communities who live by and with those lakes. And it, I'm fearful that if we just talk to stakeholders, we will forget the people who live in Queenstown, mm -hmm. Wanaka, Hawea, Cromwell, uh, Alexandra, Roxburgh, um, Waihola, and a whole series of areas that live by those lakes and for whom the ecological, aesthetic and recreational value has an absolutely critical importance to them. So when we talk about stakeholders, those groups uh, I think even more important than any of the statutory organisations that we might have to talk to, because they are the people who literally live with those lakes every day and for whom it is their lifeblood um, of those communities as well. Um, I share Councillor Gary's concerns. I guess the challenge, Gwyneth, is to alleviate those concerns when the scoping study comes back. Um, and I think good consultation with those communities and with the university will, I think, also alleviate some of the concerns within staff. I'll support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Hope. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laws. Uh, I also support this motion, and I just suddenly thought about what you said. It's not just great the greater communities, but you think of all the boaties that come from actually near and far. Might not have a lake near them, but they come to that, those lakes because they love them. Um, and that's a big, a big, a big thing. And maybe a, one way of through that is through the Harbour Master. You know, they seem to have great turnouts, great nights. I know Councillor Wilson's just talked about the community. How do we get them out there? Um, the the, the Harbour Master seems to be a fantastic way of drawing people to meetings. So yeah, happy to support it. Councillor Malcolm, who's been eager to have his um, right no, to reply. No, 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 I, I, I just think this has been a really. Uh, I, I enjoyed the paper because it got me thinking. Uh, we were trying to head. Uh, that was very good. Um, Councillor Wilson, uh, we're getting on with our land and water plan, and I think we relay to our people that are that we're going to consult with at the same time about the lakes, is that to ensure we get our land and water plan right, we want to know what you're actually doing at the moment in your lakes and make sure that fits in. And so... Um, Taking notes, Kate. Ed, Edward, uh, I was going to say it slightly differently. I was going to say from the top of the river to the bottom of the river, but... Uh, look, how do we, unless we have the full knowledge of what's actually happening at the moment on the lakes, how do we ensure that they are actually participating in the reality it should be from the mountains to the coast? So, I, I mean, we, ne we need to make sure that all those plans actually fill in, fill in with what we're trying to achieve and what we have to achieve. Uh, but, look, our, our RPS, our land and water plan, our FMUs, our catchment group activity, they will actually deliver... Uh, exactly what we're trying to achieve with the lakes. I'm, I'm absolutely sure of it. But we need to know what we're trying to find out at the moment is, is what actually is happening at the moment, what else we have to play around with to make sure we are doing it right. So I, so I think this initial scoping is absolutely perfect, and after that we'll decide what to, to head from. So uh, I'd, I'd like this everyone to support it, and, and I think it's a very important step on, on the stages that we're actually at the moment with our land and water plan. So... Thank you. That's Thank you. That was the right of reply. I'm therefore going to put it to the vote. All in favour, please. Uh, this is just to make sure it's on the page eight of the um, report. 
um, approves the proposed brief and scope of the project associated to the Council's resolution made on 26th of May 2021, requesting a scoping study for an Otago Lakes strategic plan. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Unanimous, if not, um, and not, not challenged. So consensus politics of sorts, I think. Thank you uh, very much. Great yeah. discussion. Um, thank you for bringing that to us. The next report is 7.2, the air quality knowledge gaps. Winner, who have you got today? Sarah? Sarah. Sarah's joining us. Um, and while she joined us, again, you'll remember at the DIAC committee meeting on the 8th of September, um, Sarah presented the air quality state of the environment report to you. Um, that report um, talked about some knowledge, uh, potential knowledge gaps and potential investigations, um, and you asked, referred it to this committee for more information on those, and that's what this report's about. Do you want to? No. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. you did nothing else to add to that, Sarah. Thank you, Councillor Hope. Thank you. I've got questions. Some, yes, yeah. I do. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I would like to discuss with you, please, on page 17 and 18, investigations for outdoor burning. And I have some questions for you, please. So, and this is what I'd like to ask. The burning stuff seems to be focused on rubbish burns, slash, etc. And there are concerns that the debate should be broadened to include vegetation burns as well as they must be a significant source of air pollution as well as impacting on other values. And this is what I'm, I'd like to, to, to portray here. I'd like to see the systems that allow major burn-offs question. For example, we're concerned at an international level with the loss of native vegetation, how the smoke and gases from them contribute to greenhouse gas get issues as well as air pollution. I'm also concerned at the loss of cover, especially on sleep, steeper slopes, which contribute to the increased water runoff and flash flooding. We've seen more of that gone by, and you have to think about Roxburgh. And it was a question I had actually asked Dr Palmer in my first term, what were we doing about that? So we didn't have another Roxburgh again to do with the tussocks if we remove them. So that was the first thing. And also there is a report, I'm not sure if you know, and we're going back some well years, but it might be of interest, um, FRI, which is fire, and docked a large series of controlled burns in the late 1990s in the Waipori and the Roxburgh areas. That study looked at fire behaviour but also looked at impacts on invertebrates and other species as well as recovery rates. It was a very comprehensive study which should give a truckload of data information for use in decision making. We've got this here on the, on the burning on the outdoors but I really feel that there's much more we need to be asking our communities. Could we control the burn off in a different way? Could we do it in smaller patches? That sort of thing. And I, I welcome your feedback. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, we're just thinking through because you've um, broadened, I guess, broadened yep. scope from air discharge to other impacts. Um, yep. And so just thinking about... Um, you may not how have that would right now. Yeah, we might need to come back to you about how we would think about that and where we would be thinking about that in terms of our regulatory approach. Certainly can we? Question, can we come yeah, back to you? Absolutely. It's certainly a question I get asked a lot. I'm not sure about you, Councillor. Yeah, I, yeah the, the burn-off for the effects on runoff for me would be a land use issue because of, of water. The yeah. um, same happens with spraying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a hard one, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if, if you've noted those questions, that's great. We've got a number of hand, hands. Councillor Scott? Yeah, sure. The, yeah, the resolution was request reporting areas of concern regarding potential knowledge gaps regarding a token's air quality. Because I think there's other knowledge gaps, and I'd be interested to know how they sort of compare with the ones you've got. Like the first one I've got is is how do we get, a, you know, a fit-for-purpose regulatory system? Because the, system, the issue we have is that we've been talking for years about smoky chimneys and this, that, and the next thing, but we seem to struggle to be able to do anything successfully about it. 
So your call that was at the DIAC committee, so that looks at data and information and particularly around the SOE network. Um, in terms of how do we get a regulatory framework, so that's our air plan um, and that's being reviewed in year two um, of the LTP. So that's where we would be discussing what do we need to put into that regulatory framework in order to manage well, it. I, I'm just sort of identifying that we've got a bit of time to think about things. We haven't been able to figure it out over the last 50 years. Um, maybe it takes a little bit of time to... We've got new staff since then. So we've also, but also, I mean, it comes back to resourcing again, right? So it's been resourced to no, do that in the LTP. I'm just looking yeah. at the resolution and comparing it, because to me, that's actually the number one thing. You know, like, because we do all this work, we do all the science, but we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. And, and so the knowledge gap is, how do we do something about it? To get well, um, again, um, we're just, unfortunately, we've written a report to respond to the original resolution. Um, so but if it's yeah, on areas of concern regarding potential knowledge gaps, so, so yeah, so so they were out, yeah. they were those areas of concern were identified in the SOE report. And the, my understanding of the resolution at DIAC mm -hmm. was then for us to provide more information about how we would address those knowledge gaps oh, identified that? in the yeah. SOE report, Sorry, yeah, not broader what no, knowledge gaps. And if you, we would have sent it to regulatory. We would have sent it to regulatory. We would have sent it to regulatory if we wanted it to go to somewhere else. It's space. Councillor Laws and then Councillor Forbes, have you got a question? Yeah. Got, no, we'll do Councillor Laws first. I was checking out. You yeah. hadn't seen your hand up. I do, thank you. <laughs> um, thinking ahead. We are going to confront the, a re, the really difficult issue in the next two or three years, and I think we've put it out deliberately because our body of work is into water. But particularly for my constituents and for Gary's and Alexis, um, I guess Carmen's you mean too. mean the entire region? Yes, exactly. Well, no, 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 because yes, particularly yes. going to it. No, sorry, Brian, it's particularly going to affect my constituents. Mine. Who are in the airshed one towns, airshed one, and as a consequence of that, um, there is going to be a move. Um, well, we're flagging the potential that um, they won't be able to burn solid fuel to keep them warm in winter. And if we are going to go down that track and the uh, enormous cost and health implications for our constituents, one of the knowledge gaps here, Gwyneth, that's missing is the causal relationship between existing um, emissions in Airshed 1 and hospital admissions for respiratory um, ailments. And that correlation is going to have to be proven by using not statistics from overseas, but from using health statistics and admissions from Central Otago and in the Southern District Health Board. Uh, the second aspect of that is that in years in which the, and this is a really good example this year actually, in which the climatic conditions in some of those airsheds in central Otago have led to a real reduction in the exceeded days, you would expect, therefore, a reduction in the number of respiratory ailments admitted into the health system. So in other words, if you've got a high number of days, like 40 or 41, compared to eight or nine. Sorry, you're shaking your head. How does that not correlate? If on 41 days of the year, you're exceeding the health standards, and yet for nine days of the year, for example, on Cromwell this year, you're exceeding them, if there's a reduction of that scope, you would expect a reduction, would you not, in respiratory infections and admissions connected with poor air quality? I'll let that, I'm happy to try and add something on exit, but I'll let Sarah have a go. Um, exposure doesn't just depend on concentrations. It can be your lifestyle, 
um, what kind of house you're living and where you're living, what you're impacted by, how close you are to an emission source or many emission sources. Um, there is a connection between wood burner density and um, um, GP visits. Um, that has yet to be published research. Um, Sorry, that's a no target. Well, it doesn't really make much difference. Yeah, it does make it's a difference. It's in Otago or in Canterbury or Nelson. Yeah. How do we know no, if it makes a difference or not? Well, that's nonsense. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. We don't know. We're not scientists. Thank you, Sarah. We're not debating that. I'm, I'm not debating. I'm just asking. I asked a question. Is that in Otago? There's health research in New Zealand and mm -hmm. all over the world, basically. It's not going to change whether we're in Otago or not. Um, we're all human. <laughs> this is all the same pollutant. Um, and there is, uh, if you want more information on health, there is um, a, a model developed developed by air quality and health scientists. It's called Happens um, Health and Air Pollution in New Zealand. Uh, they have they're re they're currently updating the model, but at the moment, if you go and look online, it has data from 2016. Um, I've included that in the. Um, in the SOE report as well from earlier this year. So the Otago model values are in that. I just wanted to clarify something, you made a statement you made earlier in your beginning to your question that came at the end. Um, you said we uh, pushed out um, the air plan and strategy as a result of our uh, knowledge base. That's incorrect. It was pushed out as a result yeah, of... It's been yeah. pushed out for uh, help financial reasons. And for priority reasons. Yes, okay. Research. I thought you said in terms no, no, of our no, knowledge. Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely for fun. Yeah, it was a financial priority thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great, we're in agreement. Um, but sorry, going back though, so there is no data. So again, there is no data, that's what I'm saying, between in Otago for in the Southern District Health Board for a correlation between those areas and respiratory admissions. And I'm saying that's the knowledge gap. There is some data, but I'm just saying it's currently unpublished. In Otago. It'd be great to get that data, wouldn't it? Yeah. Is, is it likely to be published soon? Um, Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, think, is it Councillor, is it Forbes? Councillor Forbes has a question and then Councillor Malcolm? It might be simple, I think. <laughs> uh, it's, it's spatial planning. I take it from the report that spatial planning will tell us what other sites need to be monitored. But what I'm not clear about when I look at spatial planning is how those the spatial plan will show us a site needs monitoring? No. We're required to monitor where where there's a risk of exceeding the NES. So um, we've monitored 15 different air sheds um, this winter. If, it, if, if there's high pollution nights recorded in that within those data sets, so anything over, say, um, we're monitoring PM2.5, so if it's over 25 micrograms per cubic metre, um, then we might expect to see PM2.5 exceedances in that town. And, um, and from there, we'll be able to rank literally all of our air sheds in terms of worst to best. Um, we haven't monitored our air sheds um, simultaneously before, you know, all, all 22 of them. So I think it should be quite a good indicator. Uh, and when will we see that? Uh, so we, I will receive the data at the end of this month and I will analyze it and um, hopefully get a report out early next year. Awesome, thank you. Can, can I just ask a question that relates to that, if that's okay? Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, so where we've got, and we've heard it earlier today about housing bottom lines and the need to, to develop, we've got an area that is infilled or is likely to be infilled. At what point do we actually start considering in planning that becoming an air shared problem? Mm -hmm. And because there is a heck of a lot happening in saying we just need to um, infill, and um, increase density, where do we then say, oh, but we don't want this because of that? And one is chicken and egg stuff. Uh, and it may be something we, can't, we haven't done yet. Uh, that is something that we are sort of starting to discuss for the air plan review, uh, with, um, especially with the urban development kind of thing, but sorry, I wasn't here for that um, earlier discussion. Um, yeah, so that's a kind of combined science yep, policy question. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's um, a fair one. Yes. Yeah, so I think Sarah's working with the team in terms of um, how you would choose what your air shed. So don't forget um, 
I'm using the right term, aren't I, Sarah? But so the work Sarah has been doing is in preparation of the air plan in mm -hmm. terms of trying to get a better understanding from a broader area of Otago what's happening. And that will help us understand what areas we should monitor more intensely through the air plan. Mm -hmm. But I think your question is when do you start monitoring them? Is that when, yeah, yeah, versus, it's, yeah, yeah, chicken and egg and, and possibly having rules about um, yep. allowing burners if you are intensifying or not. And it, and it yep. may be that... Um, um, you might be have enough confidence to build something straight into the plan, or you might just say we'll we'll repeat the study or the parts of the study that Sarah's doing with this broader monitoring mm. over one winter um, more frequently than the air plan gets reviewed. Um, yep. Thank yes. you, Councillor Malcolm. Sorry to because I'm no, you no, there. no, it's really cool. Um, so just just on your current upgrades and your current work, um, based. If we go to page 14, which is um, current status of network upgrade for each side, there's still nothing in there about Waitaki. Uh, and, and we know from your report that you gave us on September the 8th of the, the increase of respiratory disease and all that in that area from that air shed. Yet that air shed, we haven't changed that. So when does that get considered? Yeah, I'm hoping to get some good data um, from the the winter monitoring for this year. So we monitored in Omaru. Um, I'm not super familiar with North Otago. Sorry, I'm not no, sure if there's no, another town in there. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. So, okay, that's that's the question on the YT. So uh, back back on the knowledge gaps of the port. So, so the ports actually will be covered under the appropriate national policy statement for port activities. Uh, so other than ensuring that they are monitoring that correctly and doing the right things, do we have to do much else? Or uh, so, but in, so just adding to that, and if we are going to do something else, do we take heed of what um, what the requirements are around their activity? So, so all, all I'm saying, if they're already monitoring something and giving us, and we can get the results, why would we need to actually monitor? Yeah, so I'm just trying to save a dollar, really, just in case. We're, I could probably we could probably have a talk. <laughs> talk to the liaison group. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what they're doing, um, yeah, and whether that relates to what what we're trying to do, which is to protect human health, and whether it relates to any of the pollutants that we're sort of required to monitor. Right. right yeah. So, have we would would that be our first step to find out what's happening? Uh, because yeah, they actually have mm -hmm. to. That's their first call. Okay. Call of port, really, isn't it? That they have to. They have to comply with the consent and with the conditions of the port policy, national policy statement. So if they were doing all that recording and... Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what's in that. We can we can have a look at the conditions and consent and see if they're required to provide that data, but yeah, otherwise we can go and have a chat as well. Have we a chat, there'd be no point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, it might just be a matter of them putting another testing station somewhere else out of their bank account and doing it for us would be quite good. <laughs> Pretty ever hopeful, Councillor Malcolm. Hey. Um, hey. Councillor Laws. Asked no, it's just nicely. I, I had a look at this last year, it's what Sydney were doing, and I see you've picked it up in that table on table two. So uh, a lot of other regions outside of New Zealand measure air quality in a much more extensive way uh, than we do. Those ones there, actually it's not bad actually because you've picked up ozone and NO2 and... Um, and the sulphur oxide. Um, are we going to monitor those at all? Have we got plans to do so? Um, yeah, I highlight that as as a potential thing we could do. Um, the last time we monitored CO, uh, NO2, SO2 was um, 2004 in Dunedin. So uh, Dunedin's probably the, the most ideal place to monitor those because it has the most traffic industry compared to the rest of the region. Um, and 2004 is a long time ago. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're sort of like the classical pollutants that other people yeah. have monitored in the past. So um, probably the only relevant ones to us would be NO2 and SO2 at this point. Thank so you. are you planning to monitor in the, the, this yeah. current financial year? Yeah, so and um, there's budget in year two for screening for other pollutants. So that's sort of one of the options that we could have. Year two. Okay. Councillor Kelleher. Um, thanks. I'm just a bit unclear because the 
paper is a noting paper and it is following the um, resolution that report on p potential knowledge gaps. And then we've included the port study. So are you looking for direction from council or the committee as to whether the port study should be or shouldn't be included or not? Because when I look at the justification for the port study, we don't have cruise ships anymore. So we have quite a gap in activity. And so to me, I would immediately assume that, well, actually any study of the port at the moment is going to be not considerate of where the port might return to when cruise ships are back in play again and they're a major contributor. So it's actually what you're asking here, whether or not we would include those three, because you're also saying there's no budgeting for the port study either. Uh, so when you say those three, what are you referring to? The uh, investigation? Uh, the ULEB mission factors, no. the outdoor burning, and then the port study. So the other three no. that have been highlighted yep. as knowledge gaps. Yep. And, and some then, of them have budgets and some don't. Yes. So yes. the port study doesn't have budgets. Yep. So my question is, are you asking us as to whether we can indicate yes, do port study, or no, don't do port study? Um, not necessarily, because, again, remember, this is this is the kind of um, – the, the SOE report said there are potential knowledge gaps, right, or investigations. Sarah already knows this, so she's as part of the planning. She's built stuff into the LTP, right? Yeah. So there's a bit of a delay happening here. Cool. So the SOE report comes to you. Sarah's said, I obviously made some decisions around some things that she thinks might need to be included in the LTP. We've put budget in the LTP to do those things. And now we're giving you more detail as a request of that resolution from DIAC about what those things are and what's been budgeted for in the LTP and what hasn't. Now, if you read this paper and you said, um, actually, we think the port's really important um, and there's no budget, you might want to indicate something to us. But if you're saying also saying the port's not that important and there's no budget, then you probably don't need to indicate any direction to us. Right, but SOE, was that based on 2019? So then 2019, you did not have any of the COVID activity or issue that you now have. So it might have been what was business as usual then is now different. And we're in a period where we need to make a different decision because maybe that isn't a knowledge gap for the time being. Yeah, so it's always five years. So it's five years up, or 10 years up to... 2019. So it was a full 10 years up to the 2019. Yep. Um, in terms of, so I think, isn't that we kind of set, basically said that we haven't put money aside into the LTP. So we're not proposing to do it at this stage until we know if the cruise ships are coming back. Is that a fair conclusion from that? Yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, but there's no clear steer in here. You've got three, we're noting a report and there's three identified mm -hmm. top. I'm trying to save you work if you <laughs> – I seem to be struggling to get there. But um, I agree with the focus on the first two. Yep. I don't agree with the third one. And there's no budget. Um, yeah, well, there's no budget, but it might come up in the future. Um, cruising might come back. <laughs> yeah, but if you're going to do more work then now, you're not going to get a representation of what will be of the previous 10 years – and what might be into the future. Yeah, but there's no budget, so we're not doing any work. Exactly. Yeah. We won't do it anyway. That's what it yeah. says, there's no budget, so we're yeah, not doing it. But anything. the paper's just not clear on a recommendation to say we wouldn't do that versus the other two. Okay. It's a noting report. So if it came back and you needed to do it, you'd come back. Is what <laughs> we needed is more it? money, we'd come, be, come back to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I can't say just what the chief is going to do that anymore. I'm happy to move the report now, actually. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Did you get that, Diane? I have, I think, no other speakers or questions. Do you want to talk to your motion? I'll put the motion all in favour. All favor. I want to say is all I need is the year that I breathe. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Who sang it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, second last report. I don't think that this will take a long time. What? Um, so I just had advised that something was left off the agenda, and that's a verbal report on the Land Water Plan Governance Group, which would be great. To, um, unfortunately, that was going to be a paper, and I think it's now then it was meant to be a verbal report, but I don't think it's actually on the agenda. So I apologise for not confirming the agenda with that on there. Is that, is that how it's meant to – are you 
Gretchen and Andrew, are you doing a verbal update or not? No. No? Uh, yeah. We're or do you want to... Oh, we're at that point. Are we? Yeah, okay. No, we're not at that point. We're going to go tag, but I'm just giving you a heads up that you've got the tag report time if you want to do a verbal. I don't know. I've just had it pointed out that there was meant to be a... What was there meant to be? It's a question. Should I have been doing a an update from your group today? We can just cover off a, a, a short verbal uh, report when appropriate. Yeah, yeah. We'll just cover off a short verbal report when appropriate. Okay. Okay. It's almost been two hours. Do you want to break now, or do, do people think tags going to take? Take to break. Okay. I know someone's got to, to do complete his 450 case. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, tag. Do you want to talk about Mini Hera Care Technical Advisory Group paper? I'm happy to take it as read. Take, thank you. Um, any questions on that? Just noting that Councillor Kelleher has sat back. Thank you, Councillor Laws. Um, on page 34, so those are the five action points, I think. So it's the last slide. Can I just probe each of those just to get a bit more information from you on each of those, please? So the technical work um, that should be finished by that says finished mid early October 2021, but then it says information being collated. Is that not finished or it is? Yep. So um, I guess maybe um, to give you some context, we had initially thought we were going to have some guests to the first meeting. So we've just re, when they couldn't make it, they're on leave. So we've been rejigging things slightly in terms of what we're doing at each meeting. Um, and as a consequence, some of them. Some of the individual items might have slipped, but the overarching expectation of time frame hasn't changed. Second one, ecological health from a science perspective. Can you tease it out a bit more for me, please? Which component do you want me to tease out exactly? Well, what, what, when you talk about ecological health from a science perspective, mm -hmm. is that different than a normal perspective? Uh, TAG wanted to make clear that they will be uh, establishing a criteria for ecological health from a scientific perspective, that is not necessarily, um, I think, um, when t coming to making a policy decision, there's multiple there's multiple inputs you would have, and scientific perspective is one of those. So that hasn't been so the ecological. I just get absolutely right, so I understand, because I'm going to have to explain it to other people. So that the ecological health of the Manuhirakia River is not yet complete. Or a study on the ecolog ecological health of the manicure. No, it's a, the the task is to establish a criteria for. Oh, that's, that's just what to it get says. The criteria. That's so what it says. Establish a criteria for ecological health right, from a sorry, scientific yeah. perspective. There will be work after this then. So it can't be Not necessarily. We're just establishing the criteria. Right. So there'll be work after this. Not necessarily. No, because we may have done all the studies that give us information that allow us to assess against that criteria. Right. Okay. So we may not have, so best case scenario, we establish the criteria and, oh, we've got all that information. Cool. Tick. Yep, done. Okay. It's possible. Yep. yep. From your lens as general manager of science? Well, wait a second. Yeah, strategy policy and science, but I'm, I'm here as chair of TAG, but yep, I yeah. will. Okay. Yep. Um, do you think that that will be the case? That will have all the information. Yeah, to satisfy the criteria. Um, no, I'm going to have to recall exactly what's in the criteria. Um, put it this way, um, we got to the point where we have uh, a really robust, good discussion about what a criteria would look like, and we are at the point of discussing some quite uh, – components of that criteria and the technical nature of those in terms of whether that information is not whether the information is there or not it's whether or not they agree on um, how I guess how do I do it the robustness or that do they agree on the robustness of that information that might feed into that piece it's probably the best way to talk about it so, so there is information there it's just a question of what as individual scientists would they, how much weight would they put on that particular source of information? Yeah. 
which takes me to we'll skip the third one because I think it's sort of related in a funny way. We'll go to the fourth one then, um, and that is to do is that the drift analysis that one there? Says, oh, RRC. So you take analysis of flows no. and range of scenarios. No, that's not the drift scenario. So then, having established this criteria, we want to take all our studies and assess for a range of uh, flows scenarios. And that's the work we'll be doing in um, February, We're aiming to do a uh, meeting as well. It could be in late January, depending on when people are available. Right. And you're confident then everything will be ticked off. Well, rather, the full tag report will come back by March next year, and then we'll be able to make a deliberative decision. Um, I can't say either way because um, each meeting comes and you know, then I can't say because we haven't fully established that inventory, which is number three, um, and and we haven't fully established the criteria, I can't fully say um, whether or not I think we'll meet, meet the March deadlines at this time frame, but there's nothing to say that we couldn't meet at March deadlines at this stage. I'll have a better idea after the November meeting, yeah. And as chairman um, and with the TAG members there, is there a unanimity amongst them as to – um, on the science, is there a consensus there um, as a collection of experts? Could we expect some, yeah, common consensus by March? Or are there intractable differences in your view? And they'll probably disagree. I think I suspect you'll find that they'll agree on some things and they won't agree on it, but they might not necessarily. We may get there. I mean, that's my role as chair to try and get consensus, but I suspect there are potentially items that could be outstanding where there won't be consensus. But that's all right. We'll bring that to you back in the report and we'll let you know what the different views are, where there isn't consensus. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Calvert, but I am going to have a break if we're going to keep it. Yeah. After there can be a lot more hands. Thanks, Madam Chair of the TAG Group. <laughs> um, is the likely to be um, happiness by the participants in the TAG Group for us to be able to see the minutes? Yeah, look, um, it really got to a situation where we were um, doing track change on track change again, and I just made a call that um, it was we were better off having a discussion in person about it and getting consensus rather than trying to track change over the top of track changes. So, yes, there will be consensus on the minutes at some point and I will make them available to you when they are. Excellent, because, I, I mean, yeah. this is in some respects a more useful document than the minutes will turn out to be, but I just would like to yeah. see the minutes as they develop like Topsy. That's lovely. And thank you for your, the work you've been doing as Madam Chair here because I acknowledge that it's quite a difficult um, position to be in, especially trying to, I presume, rounding up a group of scientists is a wee bit like herding cats, like if they were lawyers, you know, rounding up cats. So I just have to admire the fact that you've produced a clear document and you do understand and can help articulate to us which way forward it is, even if they're not agree agreement about everything. We know where it is going. So thank you. Scientists at least test ideas and lawyers are just there to argue. Um, <laughs> oh, Councillor Forbes, sorry. I'm, um, honestly, I looked at this and I just sort of scratched my head. Uh, it does, seems just totally undercooked. And, you know, there's timelines that say mid to late October, but they're underway, but we haven't got anything there. Maybe to be completed in November, who knows? Nothing necessarily to trust there or not. Uh, and it doesn't seem to give me any new information on anything that we've already received. And I just wonder if this, how this is going, really. Um, well, the request is for us to report progress, and I guess I'm just reporting progress. And oh, um, it's every month, don't forget, right? So, you know... Um, we need the t the tag team needs to meet and have those robust discussions. In some cases, they need to go away and um, inform themselves better to come back to another subsequent discussion. It's not necessarily that information they need is always at their own fingertips. So, um, so there is a purpose to this. 
someone in the end. <laughs> well, it's just to report back That's to council. Wondering. That's no, the there purpose. Is, there is, there is. Ca ca Councillor Noon? It's not clear. Uh, there was a resolution passed, and we're oh, now reporting by it. That's all I'll say. Probably in the tune anyway. <laughs> Councillor Noon. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, just to inform everybody that the letter uh, to inform uh, Minister Parker was sent uh, a week or so ago, but it'll be reported through my Chair's report on the 24th of November, uh, but that was an update based on the report that came from TAG to the Strategy and Planning October meeting. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Otherwise, does anyone wish to move this motion? Thank you, Councillor Calvert. Seconded, Councillor Noon. Any? Do you want to speak to your motion? No, I thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you, Gwyneth. You've been here a long time today. Um, have you, sorry, not, and I'm sorry to add this on to the meeting, but um, I was suggested there was meant to be one. Yeah. Yep. We'll just do a brief. Thank you. And then so we're going between, to break. Between yeah. myself, Gretchen, and Edward, we'll just cover off the last um, governance group meeting, yep. um, the Land and Water uh, Regional Plan Governance Group meeting. Um, just to give you an idea, there's a hell of a lot of work going on in terms of um, reviewing the existing water plan. Um, ensuring that we meet all the legislative requirements. Um, there's a long list of um, various acts that need to be given effect to as the um, process is pursued. Uh, there's been um, a review of a number of existing uh, regional plans from throughout the country, including ECANs and various other um, plans. Um, and I suppose the outcome of that, ECANS was the only plan that has chapters, FMU chapters and provisions uh, specific to FMUs. But of course, remembering a number of those other plans were developed some time ago. Yep. So, yeah. Um, there's also been um, stakeholder feedback. So there's been um, an online survey done and, um, and also in-house uh, feedback as well um, about uh, sort of the knowledge and experience of using the existing water plan. Um, also, there's uh, some proposed economic um, analysis work that's um, going to be done in conjunction with this review as well. And we also heard about the importance of uh, making sure that we have a timeline uh, reporting regime back to strategy and planning to ensure that we stay on track um, in terms of meeting target dates, uh, because no doubt that will come under pressure as time goes on. Um, I was on Zoom, so I didn't hear this discussion around comms and engagement, but maybe <laughs> Gretchen or Edward may want to just, may want to cover that off. My audio was not good. And, uh, no, it was very, very hard. Yeah, it, it, Edward chaired the meeting, so oh. presumably you had your finger to the pulse on that. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, it was um, highlighting to us what the constant strategy, strategy was uh, for, from within management, which on LW, on, on GG, we hadn't seen totally before, so it was useful to be aware of the full scale of the, the communication uh, strategy. Uh, that is proposed for that um, the rollout. Um, so that that was a useful update, and I think, like Andrew said, it's what we are seeing at that committee is it's an oversight. We're not critiquing or getting into the depth of it, but just being aware that oh, the framework's there. I think it's giving us confidence. I presume is what strategy and planning would expect. That, that committee's at least having a first sight and um, and uh, gaining a level of confidence and understanding, understanding of what the framework is. It's quite comprehensive, a lot of papers, a lot of detail going on, a lot of work going on. It was a substantial amount. Uh, Bridget, did you want to add anything? No, there, there was a lot of different um, papers presented. Um, the 
review that's gone on of um, Otago's, well, water plan development through the ages and a lot of reports, very, very comprehensive review of every report that's gone on to do with water essentially since we've been in existence. So a lot of that work's been done, which is really great. Yeah, the economic program, um, that would need to go through the LTP to happen, but would be a comprehensive um, piece of work that would um, sit with what would be the um, economic effects of any um, interventions, I suppose, that we did across the region for um, water outcomes. Um, we looked at the region-wide provisions work. Uh, we looked at FMU updates. We looked at the comms and engagement that's currently going on as well uh, and the feedback that councillors have given and also um, this committee membership have given and that's still being analysed and we're going to receive uh, information back on what um, staff have taken on board as a result of your recommendations as well. Uh, what else? Um, we talked about two further iwi members for the group. Um, as we move into other FMUs, it's important to have local iwi members represented, and we talked about that. Uh, yeah, lots going on. And also, yeah, as Andrew's already picked up, we get to see um, in some detail the work program and the dates and things as well and keep a track of that. And we're going to have a discussion as a council as well mm -hmm. um, about how we report that back so you can see it in the manner that you need to see it as well. Yep. And final note is that we met, uh, Gary and I met yesterday on the presentations. The first one is in the Upper Lakes Rohi, which Gary will be leading on the 17th and 18th in Queenstown and Wanaka. And the 29th is in uh, November is in the Catlins. Um, I'm, uh, and David Cooper is out there beavering away trying to engage with people to ensure that there's champions in the community telling people to come along as well as the other comms. I'm thinking that I think we should have a bet around the council who can engender the most people turning up at meetings in their different FMUs, because I think the Catlins are going to be superb at this. Mm -hmm. But um, chocolate fish for the person who gets the highest number of people out to their community consultations in their community. I think, I think per, per population, I don't care how you do it, just get people involved and um, engaged in it. I think that's a worthy ambition, what, what, whichever means you go to. Um, Bearing up from Rainbow Convention and Honoroo. <laughs> um, but I think um, it's our. It, this is exactly our role to ensure that we do get people out and understanding what the characters and the values are in their areas, so that they can best inform what is in the land and water plan. It really is um, will be as good as the feed uh, the consultation in. Um, and I think there's some discussion tomorrow about the process as well in the council only session. But yeah, Any, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think because our one's going to be first cab off the rank, there's a real concern around uh, people understanding the boundaries and defining when they come along. If you in my in our one, your it, upper like Rovi yeah, is in upper lakes, yeah. we could get people from Hawea or um, uh, Lake Kedrona. Hayes or whatever or Kadrona, and mm -hmm. so we're going to have to be very clear around. You know, you, yours is going to be a meeting beyond that. Um, a lot of discussion around well. We're, we've only got two meetings, and if we don't get the feedback we need in the first meeting, the second meeting is really going to be telling the people what is going into the plan. And uh, there was some challenges back around, well, actually, how meaningful is this consultation actually going to be? We're on such a tight time frame. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so the, there is some real concern there. I think the messaging and the ability to receive feedback and get feedback in any way possible for this is going to be critical. Yep. So, so yeah. giving people to the first meetings, especially in the Catlins and the Upper Lakes Rohi, where there is only really one consultation. The following one, while we're at the moment calling it consultation, it appears to be more like feedback loop. Thank you all for your attendance today. Drive safe, those who are leaving us and can't Thank zoom in tomorrow. Thank you very much.